It is the twisted history of unethical doctors. When I read the script, uh, we did the twisted history of bad medicine, right? Yes. Do you remember that one? So uh -huh. this is different, but if you want a double dose of... Uh, <laughs> of unethical doctors you can listen to that one first and, and then and check I, this one out and i think like so a lot of stuff that and i didn't want to be repetitive and, and it winds up i'm not but a lot of stuff with the bad medicine remember it was just like some just wacky shit that we used some to do search some mm -hmm. botch surgeries yeah those were good bloodlettings people like remember there was the surgery where uh like 10 people went in i think only seven came out right which was a pretty wild number there was four people in the room there was an assistant there was a doctor there was a patient and there was a nurse so the guy nicks an artery on the patient and he dies. But as he nicks an artery, he also accidentally cuts the assistant who also dies. The nurse sees it, passes out, hits her head and dies. There was four people in the room. Three of them died. Uh, three of, out of the four died. That's the one no I was witnesses. thinking of. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we did do that. We did, we did that a little a while ago. And this wasn't supposed to be unethical doctors. When I first started this, I was just going to do this on the Twisted History of Birth Control which we also kind of did. Like, I remember saying how ancient Egyptians used to mix, like, alligator shit and some herbs and then smear it on themselves. Mm -hmm. I think the Chinese were the first to use, like, fish bladders as condoms. And then as I started to dive into it, as soon as I got into some birth control stuff, it just seemed like there was just an unethical feel to it that just kind of put me down a rabbit hole with more and more unethical doctors. So... It's the Twisted History of Unethical Doctors, uh, brought to you by our presenting sponsor, 3 Chi. It's myself. It's uh, my good friend, Jeff Fibbert. Uh, Johnny uh, Kelly is in the house before he goes on walkabout to India. John's <laughs> on his way to India in a couple of weeks, Oh, which I'm is glad awesome. you mentioned. Well, actually, we'll mention it at the end. We'll yes, the end. absolutely, yeah. And then uh, St. Anne is in the house, as always. Um, so that's it. So, like I said, we're gonna, we were going to start doing birth control. That's when I started reading about a drug called Enovid. And Enovid is a very popular birth control pill. It was the first birth control pill. And I, I, don't, I just don't know much about it, even though I love the fact that it exists. So, on May 9th, 1960, 1960 uh, the FDA approved the world's first commercially produced birth control pit, pill. It's called Enovid 10, and it was made by the G.D. Searle Company of Chicago, Illinois. So before 1960, there was no way to take a pill um, to not have babies. So development of the pill, as it became popularly known, was initially commissioned by birth control pioneer Margaret Sanger, who we mentioned briefly in the eugenics episode, and I'm going to mention not so briefly today. And it was funded by another eugenicist, an heiress named Catherine McCormick. Two older and very, very, well, not two older women. Catherine McCormick was the one who was wealthy. Uh, Sanger, she opened the first birth control clinic uh, in the United States in 1916. So the time that she was starting to uh, become a proponent for the pill, she was close to 80 years old. So in 1916, she had the first birth control clinic. And she hoped to encourage the development of a more practical and effective alternative to contraceptives that were in use at the time. So the pill, Vips, the pill, if you read the brochure, it was marketed as a safe, clinically tested way to take control of your reproductive health. But few women who took it then or since realized how complicated its development really was. How, how exciting was it for you, Vibs, in your sexual history? When you all of a sudden found out that the girl that you were about to conquer was on the pill, so it took all the responsibility outside of STDs out of your hands. You go to you go to the bathroom, you see in her trash can she's got the <laughs> the the popped out pill silver thing, the decoder ring. Go, yeah, it looks like. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's up, whore? Yeah, we're yeah, yeah. So um. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. It's, it's nice. a good it's, thing. It's a good thing. It's and a great thing. It seems thing. like it's a good thing. Yes. Right. There's some downstream effects to it that we still don't know about. Not like, for me. Not for you. So, uh, but it's just always been the pill. It's kind of like a, a, a <laughs> it's kind of like an adorable thing that exists, mm -hmm. and it's caused you to have a lot of unprotected sex. Yeah. Perhaps. Right. So, Edivid's past. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. But Edivid's past was intertwined with one of our favorite reoccurring themes. We spoke about it last week with uh, California, and that's eugenics. By the way, I'm going to do something right now, John. We talked about uh, California last week. 
I said the Red Hot Chili Peppers were the most yeah, iconic band. Yeah. Right. I saw you put it out on a tweet. Yeah. We, got, we did get some feedback. People I got a 6,000 people voted. Yeah. And the Red Hot Chili Peppers, 62% of the vote. Well, I think, That's ironically, big. the people well, that voted were not familiar with the people that were mad at you. Yes. I think they were totally different groups. Right. <laughs> and then some guys said, well, a lot of people voted for the Red Hot Chili Peppers because my audience skews younger. Yeah, I thought this was a good response. Red Hot Chili Peppers have been making fucking music for... Next year, they'll be making music for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 40 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, if I said... Blink-182, that's even kind of still dated. Red Hot Chili Peppers are, I think they're all older than me, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, I, I don't know. Well, so anyway, that what was What were the other ones. bands on there? So I, I think- Van Halen was mentioned as one that we had You should have the Doors missed. on there. The Doors, uh, the Grateful Dead and the Doors, if I could have had more Grateful to vote Dead. on. Grateful Dead. Yeah, because yeah. Van Halen I put up there garnered 2% of the vote. I don't think people, I think Van people, Halen's the greatest, one of the greatest bands that ever- uh, you know, we got together. People, but not people don't associate California. Van Halen with California. Right. They don't. I, I yeah. also think Van Halen gets more kudos for the guitar work. Right. And yeah. that's kind of the, like what stands the test of time. Grateful Dead, the Eagles, Red Hot Chili Peppers. The Doors. Oh, the, the Eagles are California, right? Yeah. Yes. I think they got Hotel California. No, they're, we, they're, somebody they're, responded in the tweets that they are not a California band. And I said, no, no, they're from L.A. Okay. And their biggest album and biggest hit were both Hotel California. Right. Yeah, yeah I know David Lee Roth sang California Girls, but then again, so did Katy Perry. Yeah, arguably that is one of the versions. best top five California songs. Arguably, maybe Hotel California. Californication yeah. was a great, you know. There's a lot of entries you know? for so, this song. Yeah, so I think we could have Metallica got next to none because I don't think people think Metallica is LA either. Yeah, they don't associate. They think it's more like no. Lars. Um, <laughs> I'd, gi- I'd give you Grateful Dead. I think that could beat the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have great. known they were from Cali. Grateful Dead. Grateful Dead. Yeah, but the people San Francisco. Like, yeah, the San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. People who like the Grateful Dead really like the Grateful mm-hmm. Dead. So, but I don't know if they realize that maybe outside of pop culture, Red Hot Chili Peppers are arguably more identifiable as ki- just yeah. they're not as good of a band as the Grateful Dead. I Re- can argue that. Yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers were on TRL. They were in like the, yeah. the music videos. Right. Gra- Gra- Grateful Dead don't really have music videos, but they just have a massive live right. show touring. Right. I put it out there and 6,000 people agreed with me. Their and the, the second was the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys is uh, legit. I, I, I understand their legacy, but I, I think that's sort of a ridiculous answer. Because no Boys. one listens to the Beach Boys. I sang every no, word I mean, to like Little Deuce Group this morning. So like no one throws on the Beach Boys. <laughs> Nobody does. And that's not an insult. It just means like they're they're more of an inspired band. Like they yeah. inspired a lot of other bands. Yep. And obviously were The Chili Peppers, huge. their brand is Cali. And I so yeah. I see your point, but I think a lot of people... Honestly, if you throw on the Beach Boys at a party, you're like a weirdo. Like, right. You're my dad. <laughs> you're my, you're my... Yeah. S- I can't wait to have John my seven and his year wife old dad. over. <laughs> when I have John and his wife over for dinner, we're going to get rid of the kids. This isn't a weird thing, John. But with John and his lovely wife, I won't mention names. Some people like to keep close to the vest. I'll make a big meal, and then afterwards I'll just put on, you know, what, what's... Uh, bon Jovi? No, Beach Boys. Animal, oh, Beach Boys. Animal sounds. Little Deuce, Cal- Little Deuce Coop, is that I don't that know that? what they sing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, Calif- and that's what I'll do. Uh, no, they're not California yeah. Dreaming. Who's California Dreaming? Animal Dream? Sounds, something like that. California Dreaming is Mamas and Papas. Yeah. yeah. You're so old. <laughs> that's a great song. <laughs> All right. Fuck. So anyway, I mentioned it. And I'll also mention that I told uh, you specifically, Vibs, that California wasn't the site of the first gold rush. It was actually North Carolina. And the town of North Carolina, that was the site of the first gold rush, which I think created most of the coins that were minted within the United States for 30 years. I had uh, mispronounced the town. I don't even know what I said. I said like Carabras. I screwed up. I can't get a town in North Carolina right, so I'm just going to give up. I will not do anything more about North Carolina. If it's in here, I'm going to take it out. I watched a documentary two nights ago, Please. Plansville, USA, North Carolina. So let's just not talk about it. <laughs> yeah. They're on, they're just been for All a couple they are weeks. is like clan and people who like to give me advice on how to speak English. <laughs> um, Sounds like Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. God bless North Carolina. All right. So we're going to talk about eugenics. We're going to talk about Enovid. Its clinical trials took place not in the mainland United States, but in Puerto Rico, where poor women were given a strong formulation of the drug without being told that they were taking part in a trial or about any risks that they'd face. And I don't mean to oversimplify here, but I also want to tell the truth. The first clinical trials of Enovid, which became what you know as the pill, took place in Puerto Rican in Puerto Rico because instead of lab rabbits they use Puerto Ricans that's how much they valued Puerto Rican women mm-hmm. poor Puerto Rican women and I'm going to go into it three women died during this test phase but their deaths were never investigated and I'll try to do a little of an investigation now so let's put a pin in it 
Three dead Puerto Rican women. Let's put a pin in it now and let's go back in order and move forward. I said that the pill's history started with Margaret Sanger. She's considered one of the most influential figures in the birth control movement. She was born Margaret Higgins in 1879, and she grew up in an Irish Catholic household like me. Unlike me, her dad was a stonecutter who made a living chiseling out angels and saints on tombstones. He's an artisan. Right? That, that seems like... Bro, that sounds so cool. <laughs> it, does, doesn't it? Watch, it sounds like something... Someone that watched the Boondock Saints all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm going to go fucking right. chisel tombstone. 1879, and you're a tombstone chiseler. That's, yeah. That is kind of cool. And yeah. you're, you're, you're an Irish guy. And just like me, outside of stone cutting, all her dad really, really liked doing was having unprotected sex with his wife, whose name happened to be Anne. Yep. That's all I do. Yep. I mean, all, right? <laughs> Popping out kids. So, yes, yes, indeed. As a result, Margaret Higgins... Mom, whose name was Anne, had 11 children and seven miscarriages. Oh. So Margaret was the sixth of the 11 surviving children. She was right in the middle. And she ultimately blamed her mom's premature death. Anne Higgins didn't make it to 50. She died at 49. On the fact that she was pregnant 18 times during her 22-year marriage. Can you imagine? That, it's like my yeah. grandmother. My grandmother was right. like That's Irish Catholics. And- turn of the 20th century. The turn of the 20th century, Irish Catholics. She had 18 kids in 22 years, and 11 of them had survived. That's a lot. So it took a toll on her mom, That's and her mom bad. ultimately died at 49. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of kids. Almost right? her mom was hit by a car. I'd say... No, no, she died. She I'm died. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, her spleen <laughs> fell out of her vagina. So Yikes. It's about eight too many kids. Right. So <laughs> Margaret went on to study nursing, concentrating on women's health. And in 1902, she married a guy named William Sanger, she mean Margaret Sanger, who was an architect. And the couple eventually had three children together. They wound up getting divorced down the road. Mm. So Sanger started her campaign to educate women about sex in 1912, by writing a newspaper column called What Every Girl Should Know. She also worked as a nurse on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, at the time a predominantly poor immigrant neighborhood. It's where I went to high school. You, the Ukrainian village, is that? Right, and remember yeah. when we had that big, uh, when that big boat had uh, had sank and then it went from being a German neighborhood to mm-hmm. a Jewish neighborhood? There was all the that. Slocum? The Slocum, yeah, the SS Slocum or whatever, that's right. Um, so anyway, that's where she was. And through her work, Sanger treated a number of women who had undergone back alley abortions or tried to self-terminate their own pregnancies. Sanger objected to the unnecessary suffering endured by these women, and she fought to make birth control information and contraceptives available. She also began dreaming of a magic pill to be used to control pregnancy because that would have saved her mom's life. To keep that fucking stone cutter's dick in his pants, right? Mm-hmm. Before he kept just knocking her up after knocking Maybe her up. Maybe he tried. After... Maybe it was her. Maybe she wanted it. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point, Ann. Yeah. Right. I know. Wow, I, I never... know an Ann a lot like that. I never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. I mean. <laughs> so right there's the first nuance. Some people think that Sanger's name is synonymous with abortion, but it's not, right? Because she's the uh, the grandmother of birth control education in the United States. So people put her in there with Planned Parenthood and then they lump her in there with being pro-abortion, but she was not. She was for women's health and safe and readily available contraception. She opposed abortion and she sharply distinguished it from birth control. She believed that the latter is a fundamental right of women. Birth control is a fundamental right of women. And the former is a shameful crime unless it was intended to save a woman's life. I know those are arcane thoughts, but I just wanted to clear up that even though she seems to be this pioneer, she was anti-abortion. She was pro-life. All right. So in 1914, Sanger started a feminist publication called The Woman Rebel, which promoted a woman's right to have birth control. And the monthly magazine landed her in trouble as it was illegal to send out information on contraception through the mail. That was her first problem with the law. There was a Comstock Act of 1873. This is what she broke. It prohibited the trade in and circulation of obscene and immoral materials, much like this podcast. It was championed by a gentleman named Anthony Comstock, 
and the act included publications, devices, medications related to contraception and abortion in its definition of obscene materials. It also made mailing and importing anything related to these topics a crime. So this feminist publication that Sanger started called The Women Rebel, which had described how to get contraceptives and what's safe for women's health, was 100% illegal. She was about to be arrested, and she was facing a possible jail sentence. So what did she do? She got the fuck out of Dodge. She fled to England and then returned not soon later in 1915 after her charges had been dropped. Then she started to promote birth control big. She started touring, touring the nation. And uh, birth control was actually a term that she coined. She coined the term birth control. And she opened the first birth control clinic in the United States, as I had said. She had some more legal battles, but Sanger started the National Committee of Federal Legislation of Birth Control in 1929. The committee sought to make it legal for doctors to freely distribute condoms and other birth control devices. One legal hurdle was overcome in 1936. So she's been at this for a while when the U.S. Court of Appeals allowed for birth control devices and related materials to be imported into the country, which kind of put a little bit of a damper on what had occurred with the Comstock Act uh, so much earlier in 1873, right? So that's all good. Vibs, this is where we are right now. Sanger's mom dies from having too many kids. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. Sanger decides to devote her life to uh, getting women more information and getting women more uh, birth control. And by 1936, she had done just that, including a legal uh, victory, which overturned some arcane law where women wouldn't, weren't allowed to learn about uh, the health of their own bodies, right? And the country had access to birth control that Sanger's mom never had. Mm -hmm. That's positive. That's, That's good. positive. She's so she's considered a pioneer as far as that goes. As a Catholic, do you find it ironic, interesting that Sanger was a devout Catholic and she invented birth control? Yeah, I I think it trumps everything. Um, when you see your mom, right, die mm -hmm. at forty nine, mm -hmm. and you, I I mean, she blamed her mom's death on the amount of kids and uh, miscarriages that she had. So that was a definitive thing, and I don't know what the medical basis was of it. I just take it as gospel, particularly since she was a nurse and she didn't change her mind. So I think that sometimes your love of the common good, and particularly to protect somebody like your mom, would trump. You know what I'm saying? Like, thou shalt not kill. But let's say mm -hmm. somebody's got a knife to my, my wife's thing. Like, it just gets trumped, right? So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't find it to. Maybe more so back then. It's a good question. Maybe more so back then because people sort of feared going to hell. Right. More so here. I mean, we, yeah, there's you know, the, the, the Comstock Act that was. Yeah. It was hypocritical, like, can, you know, compared to what her faith is. And she maintained some of it by making the difference between birth control and abortion. Right. Because I don't think the Catholic Church for a while had made that distinction. Mm -hmm. Like every time you use a condom, you're essentially aborting, you know, these things. Like, right. To a degree. Yeah. Right. So, so she so. kind of drew a line and yeah. made a stand. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain degree of hypocrisy there. You're definitely right. So. Sanger thought that women would never be free until they had the ability to control their old bodies. But her views on birth control were also rooted in philosophies that undesirable populations could be reduced or eliminated by controlling their breeding. So I never mentioned that. I said that she did this all because her mom had died. But she also thought that birth control would be cool because it could weed out undesirables. What are fucking undesirables? We, we've, we've heard about this so many times before. Every time we talk about eugenics, it's almost always the same. She thought the undesirable group were the mentally and physically defective. Using eugenic language of the era, Sanger argued that birth control could help wipe out the greatest present menace to civilization. People living in extreme poverty and those with mental illnesses and physical disabilities. So that's the greatest present menace menace to civilization not nazis not spanish flu not syphilis but people who live in extreme poverty and those with mental illnesses and physical disabilities that's not good yeah right so hey, hey that's women, not good. it's like hey women's health and then if we yeah. just quit while we were ahead right, but now right. it's like oh also let's kill hobos yeah unless you have a limp and you have no yeah. money then you're fucked does, so that's classic eugenics go ahead it does seem like everybody who researches eugenics gets a little carried away <laughs> they really and they do. like start off in the basics yes. and then they're like you can also and everyone's like whoa <laughs> listen we've had it before us and not to bring up something extremely personal 
But whenever you guys get pregnant, you have these prenatal tests where they take stuff from the baby. Yeah. And they tell you, hey, this kid has trisomy 12, which is Down syndrome, right? Or I think so. I'm not sure. Yeah, so or, or stuff like that. And then you have to make the decision on whether or not you want to abort your own child mm -hmm. as opposed to bring them into the world. It's the most terrifying part like, because you don't know going in. And then you, know, you walk out of there and you're like... Whew, like you, yeah, you just want a healthy to baby. You become yeah. a eugenicist. They do a transnuchal something, and they say, "Listen, the bridge of the nose." Because you ever notice that people who sometimes have like a visible palsy or something have shorter noses and whatnot? They measure the bridge of the nose, and right. they do this. They try to tell you. So, what do you want to do? And it's there's after. a good chance that this kid's going to be. You're 15 you know, weeks pregnant already, and you're like, "What?" A nuchal <laughs> translucency <laughs> test, I think it's a called. And they yeah, measure yeah. the brain, and they measure the. You know, in the back of the head, all these different things, and you're like, I didn't sign up. Like, I, I, you don't realize but that you you're did. going through it. You sign up for it, and then all of Doctor a sudden, Doom. I'm like, what are we doing? Just like, because they can't treat the fetus. The only reason they're doing it is just, or maybe they can, I don't know. But it seems like one of the overarching things to do is to put the ball into your court yeah. on whether or not you want to bring in something that is something, some person that is unfit. It's, Having kids suck. And they I mean, tell you, we're just giving you the information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. The don't decision we, is yours. I, I think we've mentioned this before, so yeah. I think we're right it's about a this. deep conversation. Don't we do this with um, Down syndrome? Don't, aren't yeah. we like very good at predicting that yeah, now well, that we you used take to a, be? When you get a sonogram, they don't even have to do a amnio anymore. Right. With a sonogram, I think, I could be wrong, is um, there's a specific area they look for, a white spot on yeah. the sonogram. I want to say, uh, oh, I don't know about the sonogram. It's like... Gene twenty twenty one or something. Something like that, yeah. Right. yeah. But it meaning no, like chromosome twelve. Like that's what it yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So it's like trisomy like an extra chromosome in the twelfth. Well, like the, one of them like yeah, I don't I don't know the specific <clears throat> names yeah, yeah. of them, but I think now with Down syndrome they can do them do the nuchal translucency test. Yeah. They measure the bridge of their nose. Mm -hmm. And then they also look for this specific white spot. Right. Right. And so I some people can just turn that down and be like, Listen, I don't well, care. I think don't they recommend it now? They do, yeah. I think I they're like, right. yeah, you're, you're, it's me, so far me. out. They right. didn't tell me that's what I was going. I had no right. idea that's what I was doing. You're so old, right? They did it with I like a, a very <laughs> strong light bulb, right, in the back of a barn. 23 <laughs> chromosomes, 21. They turned the light on. <laughs> yeah, something on, like that. It's on the 20, 21st 21st? chromosome. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's dyslexia. But anyway, this is all classic <laughs> eugenics, right? A better breed of human could be, achieve, could be achieved if the fit could have more children while the unfit could not. So give condoms to the unfit. And this was a popular belief before Hitler had people questioning what everyone's definition of fit and unfit included. Hitler was the best thing that ever happened to eugenicists. It was the worst thing that ever happened to eugenicists, the best thing for everybody else. Because they started to put those two together and be like, wow, we're a lot closer to Hitler than we are to anything else. So there are debates over whether her eugenicist beliefs were based on class rather than race. Meaning, was she a classist as opposed to a racist? But I say she was probably both. She spoke with the Women's Auxiliary of the KKK in scenic Silver Lake, New Jersey at one point. She spoke with them. She, she said, if I can get them correct birth control, I want to. But she also spoke with W.E.B. Dubois, the co-founder of the NAACP. Uh, she spoke with Martin Luther, and, uh, Martin Luther King and Coretta King. And Martin Luther King Jr. had accepted the inaugural Margaret Sanger Award. So she did play both sides of the aisle. Either way, her interest in eliminating extreme poverty drove Sanger to look for and invest in more modern forms of birth control. So this is bringing me up to the pill. I gave you a little bit of Margaret Sanger, the eugenicist. She had long wished for a discreet, nearly foolproof way to control pregnancy. So she met with a controversial biologist slash zoologist whose name was Gregory Pincus. He's an important name. He specialized in mammal reproduction. She asked him if his work could be used to create a cheap birth control pill, and he said, I'll try. I'll give it a fucking whirl. And then Sanger introduced him to Catherine Dextra McCormick, who was a philanthropist who underwrote what would become one of the 20th century's most ambitious and risky scientific experiments, the development of the pill with Dr. Gregory Pincus. At the time, female reproductive system was largely a mystery to science. I gotta be honest, it's still a mystery to me. And birth control was strongly regulated by state laws 
that made it effectively illegal to research or distribute. Female reproductive system, nature's Rubik's Cube. And you're damn right. Yeah. I don't know anything what goes on in that. Just mm-hmm. please take care of it. And I have a daughter who's coming. I don't really want to talk too much about it, but I'm like, Annie, please. Mm-hmm. I'll take care of the boys. I'll talk to him about it. But I just am so... I don't, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I'm done with it. Um, so, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so, Massachusetts was where this guy Pincus worked out of. So, he began his work in the 1950s. But Massachusetts was one of those states that was really strict with all these things regarding women's health. So, Pincus and an obstetrician named John Rock, Rock and Pincus, began working in secret to figure out if it was possible to use progesterone a hormone produced by the body during pregnancy, to prevent pregnancy in women. And in the lab, it prevented pregnancy in both rabbits and rats. But would it work in women who weren't yet pregnant? And the only way was to try it out, and Pincus would have been thrown in jail in Massachusetts if the real nature of his research was discovered. He conducted a trial in a small number of women, excuse me, he conducted a trial on a small number of women hiding his research under the auspices of a fertility trial. But in order to get the drug approved, he'd need a wider clinical trial. In steps Puerto Rico, right? I'd, I'd rather do Puerto Rico than Massachusetts, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. Especially this time of year. <laughs> but Puerto Rico back then was a fucking mess. This is the 1950s. So at the time, it was in the midst of a population boom and poverty, poverty was rampant. It was also the home of birth control clinics already that had once been funded by the U.S. government under the New Deal program, but were now funded by Procter & Gamble heir and American eugenicist Clarence Gamble. The gamble of Procter & Gamble, PG, like we like to tear apart places like Bayer and whatnot, Procter & Gamble was founded by a huge eugenicist whose name was Clarence Gamble, and he believed that unfit Puerto Ricans and others living in poverty should be wiped out to make room for more fit members of the population, and birth control was part of that vision. So this guy Pincus needed a place to fucking test women, and Gamble's like, come on down to Puerto Rico. We have so many unfit women that I would love to see sterilized. This is kind of like a uh, evil Bond villain thing. It's something else. Procter & Gamble, the evil corporation, <laughs> on an island, just kind of... Right. Just sterilizing, sterilizing fucking Puerto people. Rican women. Yeah. yeah. Gamble was so deeply involved in Puerto Rico's policy of encouraging women to undergo sterilization as a form of birth control that between 1930 and 1970, approximately one-third of the female population of Puerto Rico was sterilized. Holy shit. So between 1930 and 1970, one-third, one in three females in Puerto Rico was sterilized, Mm. making it the highest rate of sterilization in the world. And many of them were involuntary under policies that pressured women to undergo hysterectomies after their second child's birth. So as soon as you had that second child pop out, we took all your works from you. That's fucking crazy. Sterilization was so common that it was simply referred to as la operacion, the operation, right? The atmosphere was a perfect storm to create candidates for Pincus's trials. Right. Because outside of the legal ramifications in the U.S., educated women didn't want to try this new medication, fearing side effects. But less educated women living just below the poverty line in Puerto Rico were desperate to avoid pregnancy and sterilization. So you give a poor woman in Puerto Rico and you convince her, hey, listen, you take this pill for a certain amount of time, you will not get pregnant. You can still fuck like a rabbit. You will not get pregnant. Right. Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, really? So I can stop taking it, get pregnant when I want to and stuff, as opposed to getting pregnant on accident for the second time and then having a full hysterectomy. Sign me up for the trial. Except the trial that she's signing up for was a drug that had un, un insanely high levels of progesterone and it caused a bunch of different downstream uh, side effects. So Pincus focused on that group of women during clinical trials and recruited in the poorest areas of San Juan and other cities beginning in 1955. Women who took the drug knew that it prevented pregnancy but had no idea it was experimental or even that they were participating in a trial. They weren't given safety information, and women experienced serious side effects since the pills created such high doses of hormones. However, Pincus didn't feel that side effects like nausea, blood clotting, or depression warranted a reformulation of the pill. Their only concern was proving its efficacy. So he's putting the pill in front of the women. And those three women who died during the clinical trials, 
they never had autopsies. Right, And the reason they didn't have autopsies is because by not autopsying the body, Pincus was able to maintain the uncertainty of whether those fatalities were linked to his pill. By modern standards, these secretive trials were both unethical and unsafe. Women who agreed to take the drug did so out of desperation and without full disclosure of what might be at stake. But for Pincus, the trial was a fucking huge success. The high dose of hormones all but ensured the trial participants would not get pregnant. And in the field trials, the pill was nearly 100% effective. And he didn't stop testing. A second trial, which was funded by Gamble, of Procter & Gamble, and the pills were also tested on women and men in mental asylums without consent. So they went for crazy people also. When Enovid finally was introduced to the U.S. in 1957, it was an instant hit. And with the guise of safe clinical trials having already been conducted in Puerto Rico, American women were like, let's do it, right? They go through side effects like spotting and the risk of blood clots in exchange for a discreet, inexpensive, and effective birth control. So after three years of legal tweaks with American women in 1960, Enovid was approved as a contraceptive, ushering in a new age of women's sexual health and creating a lot of whores for you to kind of pillage at bars late at night in Hoboken. Yeah, perhaps. Ne- next time you say whores playfully. Next time you're you're dropping one in a girl, yell out Pincus. <laughs> <Yeah>. Thank him. <laughs> Pincus, gamble. Yeah, you're not gambling because of gambler. Yeah, next right? time next time you're going raw and you yeah. Maybe name it Pincus. What? Name it Pink, right? Uh, you know I don't like the name. Pink it sounds weaselly. It does. Sounds right. small. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so it's a three-sided coin here. Recent studies still link the pill to side effects like clotting and depression, but all in all, it was a great invention that came about only from what was arguably a murderous scientist that was funded by historic eugenicists, right? So there was murder, there was eugenics, and there was the pill. Pink. Right? Yeah, so next time you come, go pink ass. And then she's like, who's that? He's just a murderous scientist. Don't worry, <laughs> yeah. baby. Who killed Puerto Rico. Go Rican back women. to bed. Yeah, yeah. What? So <laughs> this, is, this was the beginning of the twisted history of birth control. And from there, I immediately took a left turn, and I never came back to birth control. That's why it became this whole thing about uh, unethical doctors. Because having that two-sided coin reminded me of somebody that everybody should know about. I, I say once uh, once an episode, I'm going to talk to you about somebody that you should know about. I think last week we went, we talked about the great uh, William Clay, Henry Clay, the great compromiser. Henry Clay. Yeah, Henry Clay, the, the great compromiser. I'm telling you right now, everybody should know about another guy who was a two-sided coin, something that I call a necessary evil, and his name was Fritz Haber, and he's a worthwhile left turn. Please pay attention, but first let's talk about your own health. Betterhelp.com. This is a podcast that's sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We talk about BetterHelp a lot on this show, and this month we're discussing some of the stigmas around mental health. There shouldn't be any, right? Like, It's okay to go and try and talk to somebody, and it's okay to go and try and talk to a stranger, and sometimes it's a lot better because they don't judge you. And BetterHelp is the easiest way that you can get any type of therapy, in person, Zoom, discreet, whatever you want, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Please give it a try. Two million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy, and I think the world is better off because of it. How do I try this, Large? Just go. Go to betterhelp.com slash twisted, and you get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash twisted. Betterhelp.com slash twisted. Go there. <laughs> Like, if you go there because you recognize that there's something wrong with you, that's the first fucking step. And I guarantee that that's a positive step into curing things that ail you, right? So betterhelp.com slash twisted. There is no stigma to talking to people now. All right, so back to Fritz. Back to the guy that I think that everybody should know. Back to a guy who probably has fed more people than any single person in the history of the world. That's a great thing. Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber was a German Jewish chemist. German Jewish chemist. There was a time where there weren't a lot of those. Mm -hmm. This was before that time. Who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1918 for his invention of something called the Haber-Bosch process. 
It's a method used in industry to synthesize ammonia from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. This invention is of importance for the large-scale synthesis of two things, mm -hmm. fertilizers and explosives. Let's look at the fertilizers yeah. first. The fertilizers are good. It's estimated that two-thirds of the annual food global production uses nitrogen, nitrogen from the Haber-Bosch process. That's today. Two-thirds of annual global food production uses nitrogen that's derived from the process that Fritz Haber had discovered. And that two-thirds supports nearly half the world population. That's very good. Yeah. It's like the scientific method. It just works. That it's is, it sticks. Yeah. They said that Fritz Haber was able to pull bread from the air. The only other person that I know that they talk about in those terms was a guy named Jesus Christ, right? The loaves and the fishes and uh, the wine mm -hmm. and the water and all that stuff. I've heard of him. Fritz Haber was that type of guy. Before his world-changing discovery, scientists believed the human race would top out at 1.5 billion and then face starvation. This was a popular belief at the time. It was called the Malthusian theory, which said that the human population grows more rapidly than the food supply until famines war or disease reduces the population so like a thanos snap occurs when the food supplies run tight so you're going to keep going fucking and having kids fucking and having kids fuck but we're not growing enough corn to support you so then something happens a distinction era event mm -hmm. that brings the population back in and the malthusian theory thought that that number was at around 1.5 billion the Earth has over eight, uh, around 8 billion people nowadays. So the reason, one of the reasons that that theory didn't come true was because of Haber. He set a different course by solving one of the greatest problems humanity have, has ever faced, how to feed the world, right? This is what he was doing, how to feed the world. I'm barely feeding my family. Or practice birth control. Yeah. Germany, yeah. <laughs> Germany in the late 1800s had 50 million Germans, and they had the sunlight and the land to feed about 30 million Germans. So without a way to fertilize their crops, another 20 million Germans would die of starvation. That's what they were facing in Germany. 50 million, 30 million could eat, 20 million are about to die. And the solution was pretty simple. The amount of crops one can grow is directly tied to how much nitrogen can be provided. And nitrogen is everywhere in our atmosphere, but there's no way to pull it out. And that is until Haber figured out how to break nitrogen's bonds under extreme heat and pressure with added hydrogen. And out of his experimental tank dripped liquid fertilizer that changed anything. In 1909, he unveiled his discovery to the world, and today 100 million tons of synthetic fertilizer is created each year by his method. For nearly all of the 8 billion people on Earth, including Vibs, including John, including myself, and including St. Anne, half of the nitrogen in your body comes from the Haber method. It's perhaps the greatest scientific discovery in history. That is very fucking good. Fritz Haber was very, very, very good, right? He fed everybody. Mm -hmm. I just called him Jesus Christ, okay? Here's the bad, John. Comes in three parts. World War I begins. Fritz Haber loved Germany. He was immensely patriotic. He volunteered for duty by letter to the War Department saying that chemically the same amount of energy that it took to separate the nitrogen from the hydrogen was released when they slammed them back together. And in this letter, he explained to his superiors that by reversing the chemical reaction he used to grow life, he could make explosives, which he did for the Germans. By the way, the Germans didn't win World War I, but he extended Germany's uh, participation in World War I probably for another three years, killing a lot of people, right? His discovery and the vast amount of ammonia factories he masterminded created bombs that helped extend the war. He's considered the father of chemical warfare for his years of pioneering work developing and weaponizing chlorine and other poisonous gases during World War I. World War I, you remember, is trench warfare. Right. So you would dig a trench 500 yards away. Mm -hmm. I would dig my trench 500 yards from there. No man's land was in between us. Right. And all, nothing would happen. We all saw 1917. Yeah, you just got 100%. Gotta, yeah. Every now and again, you charge, somebody would kill you. Then they charge, you would kill it, there'd be bombs launched, but nothing mm -hmm. would happen. This son of a bitch had discovered that even if you threw tear gas into a trench, mm -hmm. tear gas dissipates and goes up, just like everything else. He created chlorine gas, which was heavier than air, so it would creep. And he was there the first time that it was used. The Battle of Ypres, 
I think it's spelled like Y-P-R-E-S. I think I'm pronouncing it correct, unless, of course, you're from fucking North Carolina. But the Battle of Ypres, right? He brought in tons of chlorine gas, waited for the wind to uh, uh, agree with him, released it. And this chlorine gas, you have to read about. Please read a first-person account of what had happened inside these trenches at the Battle of Ypres, which is in Belgium, as Germany was trying to get through Belgium to get to France. This chlorine gas was taken by a barely stiff wind across no man's land, and then it fell into these trenches as it was going across, killing thousands. And nobody run it. You could have, I mean, you could have run away from it easily. Yeah. I could have run away from it easily. That's mm-hmm. how slow it was moving. And people were just in there breathing it out. And to die from chlorine gas is a fucking terrible death. All that stuff was invented by Fritz Haber. Right, so it's it's accounting now between the explosives and the chlorine gas, hundreds of thousands of deaths, mm-hmm. but hundreds of millions are being fed. Right, that's where the two sided coin is, and I'm not fucking done. Oh. So it's explosives and it's gases. Yeah, and then on top of all that stuff, one of his fertilizers was called Zyklon A, and they took the fucking uh, odor out of it, mm-hmm. and that's essentially what became Zyklon B. And that's what they pumped into all the fucking gas uh, chambers in Auschwitz. Damn. So he was the direct fucking inventor of what went through the gas chambers. As a Jewish man himself. Fuck. Right. So thousands of Allied troops killed. Thousands of Jews wind up being uh, gassed because of his stuff. A quarter century later, with Eber long dead and gone, his same... Inse- so this is what I wanted to say. Zyklon A becomes Zyklon B. He never saw that happen because he was thrown out of Germany before World War II had started. Mm-hmm. Even though he's the guy that, you know, I compared to Jesus Christ, Hitler said, that's great. Now we know how to uh, pull nitrogen out of the air. Get the fuck out of Germany, you Jew. That's what he said. And then the Zyklon B, that was a direct descendant of his uh, insecticide or fertilizer was used to kill Eber's ancestors. I think he had sisters, nieces, mm. nephews that were all gassed because of it. It's fucking terrible. It's fucking terrible. But I think that Fritz Haber might be the biggest two-sided coin in the history of two-sided coins. Mm. Fed hundreds of millions, billions, and also did some very fucking bad stuff directly between the two world wars in, in Germany. Jesus, if he kind of went down like the, the Unabomber route. Yes. Kind of a good guy, and then the same, yeah. Which he, we're not saying he did that. We're not saying that Jesus blew anybody up. No, no, he did not. That we but know of. you know who did blow somebody up? Oh. Timothy McVeigh. He okay. used ammonium nitrate fertilizer, two tons, when he blew up the um, Murrah building. I, I, right. You brought that up because I thought in my head, I was like, I wonder yeah. if you could tie this guy to him you as tied well. Him, yeah, the, the, yeah. F- the fertilizer. He killed 168 people blowing up that building. Yeah. Yeah. He's the reason you can't just buy. He's the reason if you're of Middle Eastern descent, you can't buy a ton of fucking uh, fertilizer at Home right. Depot. That, Honest to God. And because he did it in it's, his house. It's Timothy like, McVeigh made that. That was homemade. Yeah. Uh, Two tons of right. homemade. Right. I'm and listen, it's not a direct correlation to the fact that Sudafed also makes meth, mm-hmm. but one couldn't happen without the other. Mm-hmm. You know, right. whatever the active ingredient in Sudafed Same is. Same thing with the, the, the Barut bombing, the Barut bomb that went off. Yeah, the yeah. Fertilizer in that, like, warehouse. Yeah, yeah. I still think, I could be wrong, but I think the explosion in, at Oklahoma City surprised even McVeigh. I don't think he thought. Maybe he didn't think big. it was going to be that strong. I think he thought it was going to be strong. I don't know if he thought he was going to take off the half of the building. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. I watched a lot of a lot of docs on on Timothy McVeigh, mm-hmm. and then the whole thing. A lot yeah, of docs. he was yeah he was in on that with uh, with a buddy from like, the military, and they yeah. yeah. Did yeah. they yeah. televise when they when they injected it with the, the lethal injection? Was that on TV? Yeah. Did we watch that? It was. I feel yeah, like yeah, I yeah. watched they put that, like but you can't find up. it anywhere. Like you, I've Googled it. I've because well, they put like a thing up, so they were like live all the way up to it, and oh, then okay. it sort of like happens behind a barrier, mm. and so you don't like watch it. So they face. closed the curtain. We yeah. didn't actually see the. I think you were watching because uh, there were family members there. The reactions of them. I think that's what they did. Okay. I remember. I remember watching that, and I was like, now when I go Google it, you can't find it anywhere. I remember the, the best clip they got was, like, him chatting with his lawyers and, like, laughing beforehand. Okay. Like, they were having, like, a coffee conversation, and everybody was like, well, that's kind of a weird tone yeah. before Mc, you die. McVeigh was at, at Waco watching from a hillside. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, can crazy. you close that? Can you push that close? Yes, yes, yes. You yes, mentioned, yes. are you cold now? Because yeah. I, I had opened it to uh That's perfect. Cool I'd rather now. be cold. I wore an yeah. extra layer. Yeah. So. When I'm warm, I'm dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you get all puffed up in here. <laughs> yeah, you do. I do. All right, so 
so that's it. I, I think that's important to know Fritz Haber. And I think I think I've stressed enough that people will know who the fuck he is. That's a big Fritz name. Haber. That's yeah, a yeah. big, it's a big, big role in yeah. history. Um, we're going to stay on the double-sided coin, but we're going to go back to medicine uh, because this is unethical doctors. Mm. And we're going to talk about another guy maybe you want to remember. His name is James Marion Sims. He's the father of modern gynecology. Here are the positives. Sims developed pioneering tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. More specifically, he invented something called the vaginal speculum, a tool used for dilation and mm. examination. This is a vaginal speculum. Yep. So it looks like a sort of like a hey, how are you? I'm a, a duck. vaginal it look, speculum. It looks like a duck. It does. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A, a metallic duck. So, but back then, when you were trying to give a woman an internal exam, the vagina was considered uh, gross. Not gross, but it was sort of like taboo. They really didn't know how to do it. So this guy had taken a bent pewter spoon and he had shucked the clam a little bit, like he had opened up, and that way he was able to go in. He wound up creating this thing where you can kind of insert, open up, and then kind of do what you need to do through the opening. So this is a speculum. Yeah, it's unbelievable how easy it is to purchase a speculum. Not mm -hmm. that you, I mean, not that you're going to smoke crack with it or anything, but they say it's a big fetishist item. Yeah. So when I went yep. on Amazon. Two days ago, I had 16 different options to get it to me within 24 hours. So I got this one. Is that is that the Cadillac of septulums? I, I, I was spe uh, speculums. Speculums? I, yeah, I went with the one that was $14. So I'm sure you can get something that's a little bit uh, more um, more pricey. They can also come in different colors and different finishes and different uh, mm. materials. So anyway, this is what he in, in, this is what he introduced, and it's still okay. used. Andy, this is still used today, right? It's, like, yes. it's yeah. like a car jack for yeah. a vagina. Yes. Now they keep them in warming trays. Yes, thank Ooh, God. See, I like that. Yeah. It's the little things. Yeah. yeah. You could use this for like a colonoscopy the too, pinkest right? things. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, get, I don't know. Oh, like, you could. The whole could. idea is I mean, just... You wouldn't get very far with a colonoscopy there. <laughs> no, I'm saying if you oh, need to you get the tube... Oh, you can force it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Either way. So he, he invented this. He invented the, uh, the, uh, the speculum. It's used for dilation and examination. He also pioneered a surgical technique to repair something called vesi covaginal fistula. It's a common 19th century complication of childbirth in which a tear between the uterus and the bladder caused constant pain. In 1876, yeah, <laughs> he was named president of the AMA, the American Medical Association. And this is why and believe me, it rips births, women I apart. Him in the room. God bless you. <laughs> It rips women apart. It's fucking... Don't, uh, don't they staple the it? How the fuck did Miss Higgins have 18? I heard they staple uh, it together. There's some sewing. I wouldn't, and no, I didn't do yeah, 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 yeah. Nope. Right. <laughs> I heard because yeah. women have like less, oh. less nerve endings oh. and smaller brains. They can't yes. feel it. So they just staple them shut. <laughs> I just, every time I think of childbirth, I think of that fucking pyramid that they used to lower the guys on that you uh, had done. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's like a septulum a little bit. Yeah, sort of, yeah. So, this guy... Yeah, speculum. Let, speculum. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I stopped with it. Yeah, in yeah. my head, I've put that it's septulum, and <laughs> right. that's what I'm going to call it forever. Right. I should have circled it on the script. So, again, so we're with uh, James Marion Sims. So, he, he developed the speculum from a pewter spoon, and he also discovered this... Um, technique to repair this tearing, this fistula that happens sometimes during uh, childbirth, and it causes leakage and constant pain in women who suffer from it. Is that where the phrase, she was born with a pewter spoon in her vagina comes from? <laughs> yes, that's yeah. exactly <laughs> why it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. In 1876, he was the president of the AMA. In 1880, he became president of and the like American that. Gynecological Society. She really did like that yeah. one. Yeah, a silver spoon and a pewter spoon. Uh, he has a half a dozen statues dedicated to him around the country. But the one in Central Park right here was removed in 2018, and it's set to be reinstalled near his grave in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn at some point. Greenwood Cemetery is where my father-in-law has been laid to rest also. But why was that statue taken down from Central Park? Why was Dr. James Marion Sims, who found a way to, uh, to repair fistula, he found a way to look inside a vagina with some degree of class. He sent, Why was it? He sent unwanted texts of his penis. <laughs> he did. He to did. his assistant. Right. Why was this guy who did all that shit in and around the 18, I don't know, 18, mid 1800s, called 1860s. And that's where the bad part comes in. Sims's research that he did to create all this stuff was done almost exclusively on enslaved black women. And he did it without anesthesia. My God. Similar to Pincus and the birth control story, Sims cared more about the experiments than providing therapeutic treatment. 
Unlike the Pincus story, Sims practiced medicine a hundred years prior in the mid-1800s, so nobody gave a shit that he caused untold suffering by operating under the racist notion that black people didn't feel pain. They didn't deserve fucking... First of all, in his defense, there wasn't a lot of anesthesia around, but there was some. Mm -hmm. He decided to not give it to his test subjects... Because he thought they did not feel pain. I know they also used to operate on babies yeah. without anesthesia because right. they thought they couldn't feel pain. Right. And mm-hmm. all those babies became serial killers. Mm-hmm. His defenders say that the <laughs> southern-born slaveholder was simply a man of his time. He owned slaves for whom the ends justified the means. And that enslaved women with fistulas were likely to have wanted the treatment so badly that they would have agreed to take part in his experiments either way. But history didn't record the voices of these women. They didn't record the voices of slave women. All they have is the consent from their owners. So a slave woman who wasn't able to work because she had constant pain, leakage, and whatnot would just need to be signed over by her owner, and then Sims could have his way with her, right? And that owner had a strong financial interest in the slave's recovery, and it was the only legal requirement at the time. So let's go back to Sims's beginning for a sec, because I like to do that. He was born in South Carolina in 1813. That's a lot of slaves back then. He entered the medical profession when doctors didn't undergo the same rigorous coursework and training that they did today. In order to become a doctor, he interned with one. He took a three-month course and studied for only a year at Jefferson Medical College. That's not a lot. That sounds perfect. That's that is perfect. ideal. Yeah. I would have gone to you'd medical school if yeah. I could have just done uh, that. You'd, you'd, be a, you'd be a gynecologist. Yes. He began his practice in his home state, South Carolina, but he later relocated to Montgomery, Alabama, seeking a fresh start after the death of his first two patients. So right out of the gate, he kills yeah. the first two. And he says, you know what? Instead of going back, from, you know, I'm just going to pack up and I'm going to go. It's probably the most racist place in the world, which was Alabama yep. at that time in the mm-hmm. 1800s. It was in Montgomery that Sims had built his reputation among rich white plantation owners by treating their enslaved workers. He patched up uh, workers so they could produce and reproduce for their masters again, right? Because if slaves got pregnant, they produce what? They produce more fucking slaves. So... Um, if they didn't have the opportunity to work or reproduce, they were fucking worthless. So Sims comes in and solves both of those problems. If the patient's owners provided clothing and paid taxes, Sims effectively took temporary ownership of the women until their treatment was completed. And for a long time, Sims's fistula surgeries were not successful. After 30 operations on one woman, a mm. 17-year-old enslaved woman named Anarcha, who had a very traumatic labor and delivery, he finally perfected his method. He operated on this woman 30 times over four years when she was 17 years old. Afterward, he began to practice on white women, but using anesthesia, which was new to the medical field at the time. While some doctors didn't trust anesthesia, Sims decided just not to use it on the black women or any other numbing technique, right? And it was based on his misguided belief that black people didn't experience pain like white people did. He also believed that African Americans were less intelligent than white people and thought it was because their skulls grew too quickly around their brain. Sounds a lot like fucking Leonardo DiCaprio and Django Unchained, right? Mm -hmm. Like he kept the skulls and whatnot. He would operate on African American children using a shoemaker's tool to pry their bones apart and loosen their skulls. It's all bad. In the 1850s, Sims moved to New York and opened the first ever women's hospital where he continued testing controversial medical treatments on his patients. And even though the medical community debated his methods, he became a celebrated medical trailblazer. And much of that success came off the backs of the slaves that he used as guinea pigs. That's a double-sided coin. That's a double-sided coin, and it's probably one that, listen, I'm not for ripping down statues because I'm a history guy. And those who erase history are damned to repeat it. Mm. But this guy had a fucking statue in Central Park, and he was treating people like fucking animals. So if you leave the statue up, I think perhaps there's a way to tell the whole story. Or maybe that's one that just should be fucking torn down. I don't know. Like, (laughs) it's it's one of those things, right? So – Saying in that same vein, and I don't mean to get too heavy, but this is about unethical doctors, and I've been getting pretty fucking heavy in this one. 
Sims used enslaved black bodies as medical test subjects, and it falls into a long, unethical history that includes the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which I'm going to tell you about, and also a young woman named Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta mm-hmm. Lacks is not a bad story. She was a young African-American woman who came into a, uh, I think it was Johns Hopkins, somewhere in the 1950s, and she had cancer. And they had taken some um, some cells, some skin cells, samples, from inside her cervix. Those were taken without her permission or without her consent, but it wasn't un- that's something that happened back then. Fast forward, her cells happened to be like these one in a million things that actually reproduced almost every 24 hours. So now Henrietta Lacks's cells are the essential loose leaf that you would find in every lab throughout the whole world. And it came from this one woman. Her family was never like given any kind of recognition for it or actually any payment for it. And Johns Hopkins had donated her cells to every medical field that needed it. So it wasn't that bad of a story, but it's just something that people should probably know that any cancer treatment, uh, any uh, development of the polio vaccine, any development of the COVID-19 vaccines, any type of human genome experiments to learn how viruses work, her cells... Henrietta Lacks, they're called the HALA cells. Henrietta Lacks, HALA, HALA cells. Mm-hmm. They are crucial in the development about just about anything that makes you feel better. So I'm just going to give her a little bit of shine. A uh, young black woman named Henrietta Lacks, this is around 1951. HALA cells, shout out to Henrietta Lacks, right? But what they did to those poor bastards in Tuskegee was downright fucking criminal. Vibs? I take a break for a sec, right? Because I'm right. starting to get a little bit fucking heady. So can I cleanse the palate? Yes, it's something please. that John likes to do. John likes to cleanse the palate. <laughs> I so this is the second thing that I'm doing today. I just interviewed a um, a NASCAR driver. His name is Austin Dillon. And the reason that I inter- interviewed Austin Dillon is because uh, NASCAR starts this weekend. NASCAR starts this weekend. I'm going down. Daytona 500 is Sunday. It's my favorite I was race. I say, it's Daytona. Super Speedway. Yeah, yeah, it's the big one. So if you watched the race two weeks ago, they had a tiny little track. Five of those tracks could fit inside Daytona. I Daytona's s- huge. I saw that fact. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Go to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway one time. <laughs> yeah, right. The Brickyard Uh-oh. 400. There Never heard is. of it? There it is. So the greatest race in all of motorsports motor is not the Indianapolis 500 or Brickyard 400. It's the Daytona 500, and it's Sunday, February 20th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox, right? There's no better place to see a race than in the iconic Daytona Motor Speedway. I will be there. It's the 64th running of the annual Daytona 500. I'm going to have Glenny Balls, Marty Mush, and Eddie there. That's that's a sick posse. That's a great crew. Along with me and Spider. Me uh, and Spider are, oh, the, yeah. are the constants. Uh, Spider, that's a that's a crew that was on the Jersey Shore this this summer. Right. I hung out with Marty, Eddie, and Spider. Very fun. There is also a rumor that both Frank the Tank and Coach Duggs will be doing a road trip down there, trying every hot dog along the way. I don't know if we link up with them because it's going to be pretty wild. Yeah. But they'll also be around. So there's going to be a lot of content, guys, around this race. I saw, sorry, I saw a tweet that Frank sent out, and he said, Does anyone know the best (laughs) hot dogs from these most random states in the world? It was, it was. He went down the Eastern Seaboard. Yeah. Yeah. The crazy answer is him. Yes. He he would know. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) He's like, Does anyone know Delaware, Maryland? Like, he honestly went down the Eastern Seaboard. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, so it's the Daytona 500. Uh, the next gen race car will be run for the first time this week. They did it at, at obviously at the Coliseum, which doesn't count. This is the Series Cup race that starts the season, so the next gen race car will be debuted here at this at this big time race. We'll be there. It's Sunday. It starts at two thirty, and you tune into it on uh, on Fox. I was just gonna say, what's the TV network? Because football's over, Super Bowl's over, and now what are you gonna do Sundays? You wake up, you watch this race. This, yeah, this is a uh, on Fox, and definitely maybe see large naked in the infield. Absolutely, I already don't know what maybe. to do. I was I was trying to watch. Uh, Sports Center this morning, and they're they're showing like highlights from Week 14 football. And I'm like, what's going? On? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just, yeah. I, football I, is officially over, so you got to find a new yeah a yep. new slant. But if you got used to watching that race in the Coliseum, know that 150 laps was 37 and a half miles. It's called the Daytona 500 mm-hmm. because they go for 500 miles. 
right? Right. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So it's it's one of those things. So uh, uh, country artist Luke Combs will get the party started with a pre-race concert. I'll probably be hanging out with him. It's not a huge deal. Uh, but it's going to be good. Every every driver who means anything, including my good friend Austin Dillon, my good friend Tyler Reddick, who's driving the three G car. Is that a big deal? Um, will be down there, and uh, me and Spider will be providing full coverage. Devlin's going too, which I love. Devlin. Does mm-hmm. Reddick have? A, is he in the race? Yeah, Reddick's in How the race. How about that? Yeah. So, um, so you got a shot. You have a rooting interest. Yeah, I'm going to get in the car. So I'm going to get in the car by the end of the season. Oh, I yeah, see they're going to wedge video. my ass into the car. He's yeah. a, he's a very good guy. You're going to be like Ricky Bobby in that helmet. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the the palate cleanser. Honestly, that's a palate cleanser for me. Thinking about going down to Daytona. And how about this? The family is meeting me down there that night. And uh, then we're going to Disney. So oh, I'm taking out. two out of three kids, the two young Wait, ones to Disney. where is Daytona? Daytona is about an hour and a half from Orlando. Get out. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So Andy's coming down Sunday with the two kids. Mick's doing his, uh, his, his tour of the University of Alabama. So he's going to be doing stuff like that, probably drinking. And, uh, we'll have to do Twisted well, History of Disney when you get back because we were talking about doing it, weren't we? You know who signed up to do it? And I was going to tell you, Ken Jack. Oh, good. Ken Jack, because we're doing the Twisted History of Disney Princesses. Yeah. Because the I'm stories sure we'll that they about are. we'll talk Walt Disney as well. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And so the stories that they tell versus the stories that were written, like Oof. everybody in every princess story was, first of all, having sex when they were seven. And most of them had their feet cut off. I don't know. It's fucking. It's a weird type of thread that goes through. All right. So I had to take a positive thing. Good to bad. Very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So (laughs) I'm going to go back to something terrible. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment. It began in 1932. I will tell you right now, this is one of the longest experiments that I've ever read about. Right? So syphilis. We know about syphilis. Syphilis has been killing people. It was killing Napoleon's armies. It was killing Native Americans. It's been a global problem for a very long time. In the in the port of South Carolina, was it Blackbeard's ship? They yes. wanted to go uh, uh, to the shore because they needed to get syphilis medicine. And they, Correct. They ended up not being able to. And right. Died. Syphilis, smallpox. I mean, there have been a couple of things that have been an absolute uh, stain on history for uh, for people who uh, were like trying a new worlds and whatnot. Syphilis is definitely one of them. Drippy dick, as sometimes people call it. Yep. Uh, it's a contagious venereal disease. Drippy dick. <laughs> so, the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment of 1932. After being recruited by the promise of free medical care, 600 African American men in Macon County, Alabama, were enrolled in the project which aimed to study the full progression of syphilis. The men were told that the experiment was only going to last six months, but it wound up lasting 40 years. It went from 1932 to 1972, started in 32, and it ended the year after I was born. The first participants were primarily sharecroppers, and many had never visited a doctor. Doctors from the U.S. Public Health Service, I'll call it the PHS from now on, which was running the study, Inform the participants, 399 men with latent syphilis and a control group of 201 others who were free of the disease, that they were being treated for something called bad blood, a term commonly used in the area at the time to refer to a variety of ailments. So you got to think these uneducated black sharecroppers, some of which had never been to a doctor, had heard the term bad blood. Mm -hmm. And so they were being put into a test that they were told would be able to cure them of any kind of bad blood and that the test was going to last six months when in reality the test was testing syphilis and it lasted for 40 years. The men were monitored by health workers but only given placebos such as aspirin and vitamins despite the fact that penicillin became the recommended treatment for syphilis in 1947. So this this thing started in 32. 15 years into it, out of the 40, Uh, penicillin comes along as a treatment to syphilis and they decided not to give it to them. They decided not to give it to them for the rest of the thing, you know, 20 some odd years. It's fucking criminal. PHS researchers convinced local physicians in Macon County not to treat the participants. And instead, research was done at the Tuskegee Institute, which, by the way, is now Tuskegee University, which was founded... Uh, by Booker T. Washington, and it's a historic black college, right? Right. Uh, Booker T. Washington was the first teacher, Mm -hmm. I believe. But, I mean, it's a real deal place, so it's got a a, a dubious start. In order to track the disease's full progression, researchers provided no effective care as the men died, 
went blind or insane or experienced other severe health problems due to untreated syphilis. They were dying, going blind, or going fucking insane. In the mid-1960s, 30 years into this project, a PHS venereal disease investigator in San Francisco named Peter Buxton found out about the Tuskegee study and expressed his concerns to his superiors that this was unethical. In response, PHS officials formed a committee to review the study but ultimately opted to continue it with the goal of tracking the participants until all had died, autopsies were performed, and the project data could be analyzed. So in the 1960s, some guys said, stop it. They're like, nah, let's just let everyone die. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's see how it plays out. Buxton then leaked the story to a reporter who passed it on to a fellow reporter, the Associated Press, who broke the story in July of 1972, prompting a public outrage and then forcing the study to be finally shut down. By that time, 28 participants had died. 100 more had passed away from related complications, and at least 40 spouses had been diagnosed with it, and the disease, ha the disease had been passed along to 19 children. So instead of curing this syphilis at some point, 28 died, 100 more died from complications possibly from it, 40 women were given syphilis by people who were untreated, and then 19 children were given to it at birth. This is a fucking travesty. In 1973, Congress, 40 years later, mm -hmm. Congress held hearings on the Tuskegee experiments, and the following year, the study's surviving participants, along with the heirs of those who died, received a $10 million out-of-court settlement. And the final study participant passed away as late as 2004. Ten million is nothing. Nothing, absolutely. I mean, There's 800 people who are involved in this. Nothing. And right. their heirs. That's it's, absolutely. It's actually an nothing. insult. Absolutely, it's absolutely nothing. It's like it's like the NFL CTE lawsuit right. yes. where they just give them like a million dollars. Yeah. So after all this was done, it's 1997. President Bill Clinton formally apologized on behalf of the United States, first time, and to the victims of the study, calling it shameful and racist. And the Tuskegee syphilis experiment has since been cited as, here it is, quote, arguably the most infamous biomedical research study in U.S. history. But here's the thing. It wasn't the first unethical syphilis study. In 2010, Obama and other federal officials apologized for another U.S.-sponsored experiment conducted decades early in Guatemala. In that study, which was only two years, from 46 to 48, Nearly 700 men, women, prisoners, soldiers, and mental patients were intentionally affected with syphilis without their knowledge or consent. So, Drippy dick. Yeah, given drippy dick. 700 people in Guatemala in between 1946 and 1948. What the fuck's going on? What, the purpose of the study was to determine whether penicillin could prevent, not just cure syphilis. So similar to Tuskegee, some of those who became infected never received medical treatment. The results of that study, which took place with the cooperation of Guatemalan government officials, were never published, but the American public health researcher in charge of the project, Dr. John Cutler, went on to become the lead researcher, re researcher in Tuskegee. So this guy who did all the stuff to people in Guatemala wound up coming in and buttoning up doing the, the same thing to people in Tuskegee. Mm. So from 1930... To 1970, let's call it. I can tell you that 800 black guys were fucked and 700 Guatemalans were fucked by the American government testing syphilis. It's a big fucking number in what could be considered modern times. Oh, that just makes me want to move to an island in the Pacific where I'm safe and from they, the American government. No, no. as soon as you get there, anything. they're going to shoot you full of fucking syphilis. You? No, no, You'd no. You'd be easy to hold down. Atomic radiation. Bikini Island was what I was going for. They, they, oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> no, I almost talked safe. about that. I almost talked yep. about that. I was trying to get a lot of stuff on the amount of radiation that was thrown off by all of our nuclear testing, and I couldn't find anything... That was overly sexy. I need to dive mm. a little bit uh, deeper into it. Like syphilis is sexier than nuclear. Syphilis nuclears. is very sexy. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about insanity. It's gross, okay. but it, even, it is. even it being gross gets me horned up because we're still talking about sex a little. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I like it. I, that's yeah. what I try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's and why I know you're the perfect host. For yeah, if yeah. you can get me horned up for an episode, I get excited. Co-host. Co yeah. Once yeah. you call him host, then that denigrates me, and I don't like it. <laughs> I know there are three things that you like. You like syphilis, you like contraception, and you like... Women who don't have teeth. 
Yes. Correct, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about this guy. He's an American psychiatrist. His name is Henry Cotton. He had an interesting insanity theory. He was convinced that by removing infected teeth of mental patients, he could cure them of insanity. The doctor was convinced that insanity resulted in untreated infections in the body. He became the medical doctor and superintendent of the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital in 1907. A lot of shit goes down in New Jersey in this episode. And afterwards, he wasted no time proposing and carrying out his mad procedures. After taking over this hospital, immediately he began removing the infected teeth of his patients. But to his surprise, they did not always cure them of their madness, although it did stop them from speaking and sometimes even eating. Kind of like Mary, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Undeterred, Cotton concluded that the reasons his surgeries were not always successful was that the infection had spread too far from the teeth. So in such cases, he kept removing shit, including tonsils, stomachs, gallbladders, testicles, ovaries, and parts of people's colon. He reported that he managed to cure 85% of his patients. 85% of his patients were cured from him removing teeth and organs, and that was bullshit. But his gullible colleagues were impressed and eager to embrace his methods. Surgery a la cotton was regarded as the theory's best practice. Parents of mentally unstable children were anxious to get a slot in Cotton's tight schedule. And if that was not possible, they insisted that their own doctors replicate Cotton's surgery. So now Cotton's a famous man for removing teeth and organs. And he was acknowledged both in America and Europe for his radical and supposedly successful treatment of insanity. Let's take a step back. Why the fuck did people believe him? Why did they believe him that in that he was able to cure insanity in 1907 by removing testicles, stomachs, tonsils, gallbladders, and most importantly, teeth? Why the fuck did people believe him? I feel like back in the day when you didn't really have too much scientific information. Right. The better salesman you were, the more confident you were in your treatments, the better off you were. That was that was the real Definitely. key, not scientific data. I think you're exactly right. Well, that's why that guy, Dr. Liston, did, got away with so much. Oh, the guy who was the amputee. Right. The amputator. I mean, he, right. Was, he was as confident he was yeah. as they come. Did you say he was removing – were these people actually they, – they had infections, though? Is that what you said? Yeah. So maybe he was, like, unnecessarily removing stuff but before it had spread, but in a way that did get rid of the infection, right? right? So in a way, he – I don't know if it, how it would cure insanity. So, were they also insane? No, every one of the, every one of them were insane. Okay, so he would so go. So he started. Maybe it was a, a little placebo. They the were probably they drugged would, up after the Trenton the fight. thing. Was yeah. the Trenton? It was the Trenton Insane Asylum is where okay. he started this thing. That's where he said he had an eighty-five percent eff efficacy rate. Right. And so he thought that with the teeth being closest to the brain, that any kind of problem with your teeth right. was causing problems with your brain. So that's where he started yanking. And then if the infections had spread, that's when he was trying right. to remove anything else. So maybe else that would he was you. getting rid of the infection, and then there was a little placebo maybe after where they were like, oh, yeah, I do feel better, you know? But the thing about people it— People were like, oh. People in the early 1900s had zero ideas on how to cure yeah. mental well, problems. Well, we talked about this with— um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, yeah, right? Because, absolutely. Because uh, they would. Rem that was where. Remember, we talked about the brain. Talked about the lobotomy with yes. right. with Rose Kennedy. Those were often yeah. used. Yeah. Rosemary, like, right? Well, this person's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Let's try and remove part of their brain and see if right. it makes them feel better. One hundred percent. Lobotomies were big back then. So, yeah. and that. So you got to think in the early nineteen hundreds before, like we just spoke about better help, right? About getting help through therapy and whatnot. You couldn't tell somebody in nineteen hundred that, right? Like, on the one side of insanity was the eugenic theory that emphasized heredity and then the need to just simply breed out the crazy mm -hmm. if you're insane sterilize that person make sure that they don't fucking procreate that's how you get rid of insanity and the other side of the coin was a guy like sigmund freud whose theories of childhood trauma is being at the center and calling for psychoanalysis for the first time. There's no way to, to quantify or standardize psychoanalysis because everybody is different. So what this guy did was say it's not eugenics and it's not psychoanalyst. It's surgical. I can cure your crazy fucking kid. Yeah, like Just let me rip out his... So they were like, oh, really? I don't have to send him to Freud and maybe talk about how cigars are but dicks. But they also couldn't compare really, notes. I don't have to fucking sterilize myself. I can just send him to you and you'll rip out his fucking teeth. Mm -hmm. Done. And people said, 
done. They started to send it to him, and then as soon as they started sending it to him, that 85% rate fucking died. But I don't think they had – it's not so simple. Like right now, you could just shoot an email to someone or a text. I think you're thinking – more modern times. Back yeah. then, I don't think they knew. Like one hand didn't necessarily know what the other one was mm-hmm. doing. So they didn't have this knowledge that somebody in another country or across the states was doing this other type of Yeah, there probably wasn't research. a lot of oversight. Not at right. all. Until There's no way. There we was. know it now. There's. They didn't know it back then. Well, once people started to come in, they were records that he wasn't keeping anymore. It wasn't records that he was keeping yeah. just in the trend. He was putting his rubber stamp some. in the first right. few. So then right. that 85%. I'm sure that's how they all did it. That 85% turned into a 33% mortality rate. So it went from 85% of people being cured to only 33% surviving what he was doing. Mm-hmm. So that's when the that's when the bloom was taking off the rose. So some psychiatrists were skeptical and allegations surfaced that he was mistreating his patients. And in 1924, a proper investigation into his methods were initiated with someone named Phyllis Greenacre leading it. She singled out 62 patients that had been victims of Cotton's aggressive surgeries, and what they discovered was shocking. So 62 patients. 17 patients had died right after his surgeries while several others suffered for a few months before finally passing away. So 17 plus 7 is 24, out of the 62. Of course, those deaths were never included in the mortality rate to begin with. The rest of her findings showed out that out of these 62, only five patients recovered completely, while three kind of improved but were still symptomatic. The remaining patients were unimproved. So 62 people went in, 20-some-odd people died, Five people were cured, and the rest were still fucked, right? At that same time that Greenacre was carrying out her investigation, a New Jersey State Senate committee also developed an interest in the Trent Asylum and launched their own investigations. Here's something that's kind of, uh, that worked in his favor. During the investigations, Cotton suddenly went insane. The doctor said, you know what? I'm going crazy. He said that he was insane. And after time, Greenacre's report was ignored and buried while New Jersey State Senate lost all interest in the asylum. And after everyone stopped paying attention to him, Cotton miraculously recovered. And get this, apparently his madness was caused by a few infected teeth that he removed himself. So when they started investigating this guy, he said, well, you'll have to excuse me, I'm currently going crazy. And then when the investigations tailed off, he pulled out a few of his teeth and said that he was fucking cured and then he went and he pulled out a bunch of teeth from his wife and he pulled out teeth from his two children and it didn't work by the way because both of his sons committed suicide in their middle age this is fucking crazy yeah immediately cotton's mad treatments were back in demand not only did cotton continue his surgical procedures in trenton and traveled around u.s and europe giving lectures he also opened up a private clinic where he welcomed wealthy patients desperate to have their loved ones cured of madness crazy in the 1930s he retired and became america a medical director emeritus and that didn't stop him uh from concocting a new idea so he's still with cotton and his new theory had become even more uh radical he thought that it was a good idea to carry out colectomies on children to prevent insanity so he thought in order to keep your children from going crazy you got to take out part of their colons and he also took to criticizing dentists finding it strange that they tried to fix teeth instead of simply pulling them out. Yeah. His obsession yeah. With, with teeth is just... I have so that's much... That's so serial killers. Yeah. It I, really I, is. I, I had so much shit on this guy and how much he got away with it. I should have found out if they if he kept all the teeth that he pulled out. Yeah. I didn't think to look that up. I'm actually pro this. I just had a tooth removed that was and trying to kill much me. Better? So I... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our dog is much happier with his fork on. Yeah. I won't get any more granular. He died of a heart attack in 1933 and mental patients at Trenton could finally breathe more easily. All in all, Henry Cotton and his assistants pulled more than 11,000 teeth, John. Pulled 11,000. I bet they're somewhere. I bet those teeth teeth. are somewhere. They've got to be. Yeah, like some jewelry box somewhere. Yeah, Jersey. (laughs) He he pulled 11,000 teeth, and he performed 645 major surgeries. He killed hundreds of people and maimed many others. 
Yet the Times obituary declared that all must lament the loss of this great pioneer whose humanitarian influence and will continue to be of such monumental proportions. They love looking the other way. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. So anyway, so there's another guy that I think you should know. I'm going to end talking about one more guy. Uh, Beforehand, we're still screwing around with this two cents thing. www.twocents.audio slash twisted. We're screwing around with it. I know it's in beta, so it's not like a real app yet. But if you sign up for it, you can talk directly with us about what had gone on in the podcast. It's www.twocents.audio slash twisted. I need to get more involved with this thing. The more people who sign up, the more I can talk to people about what's gone on. Okay? When I said that I was going to do the twisted history of unethical doctors, Patty had said, oh, you're going to do Kevorkian? I said, I don't know. He's kind of dated. Kevorkian's kind of dated. And I came up with the new Kevorkian. And you guys may or may not have heard of this. I'm hoping that you didn't. A new suicide machine offers users a 3D printer with the ability to kill themselves at any time. So used to be Kevorkian would come to your house and perform this assisted suicide. Euthanasia. Yeah. And then here's the thing. Now you can you can download the specs and anybody with a 3D printer can create their own suicide pod. And the pod itself disconnects from the base and that pod can be your uh, your casket. It's one-stop shopping. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. The machine is known as the Sarco Capsule and it was developed in the Netherlands by Dr. Philip Nitschke, a well-known proponent of euthanasia also known as Dr. Death, which is what Kervorkian was called for mm-hmm. a long time. And he also had an, uh, an engineer named Alexander Banink. Nitschke said that the design for the machine, which allows users to kill themselves with the press of a button, will be made open source and free so that anyone with access to a 3D printer can download and assemble the instrument of their demise. I'm not taking this lightly. I'm not. This is what Nitschke said. Sarko does not use any restricted drugs or require any special expertise such as the insertion of an intravenous needle. Anyone who can pass the entry test, and I'll tell you about that in a second, can enter the machine and legally end their life. That's a quote from Nitschke. Prior to using the machine, users would have to complete an online questionnaire in order to establish their mental competency. After this, they receive a four-digit access code which opens the device. In the chamber, they can start it using voice recognition, the press of a button, or even a a series of quick blinks for paralyzed individuals. Then liquid nitrogen is used to trigger a drop in oxygen, which Bannock says is a common method used by those seeking a peaceful, elective death. Then the capsule detaches from its base and can be used as a coffin. The machine is only the latest in a series of devices pushed by Nitschke that offers people various methods of committing suicide. Nitschke released a suicide kit online disguised as equipment for a home beer kit to brew your own beer at home. That, but it was like, and that's how you would get your suicide thing. And you can think about that, like brewing and stuff and creating a poison that would be able to kill yourself. Classic. It sold for like 300 bucks, right? And like the Sarco capsule allowed users to kill themselves anywhere and anytime they wanted. He has sold it in the UK for three years despite the fact that an overt assisted suicide is illegal there. So this is what I'm talking about, unethical doctors. Nitschke once operated a general practitioner in Australia but burned his medical certificate after he became after he came under legal fire for not referring a suicidal patient to a psychiatrist. The patient killed himself and Nitschke went on to establish Exit International, a euthanasia promotion campaign in 1997. Nitschke said he would offer death to anyone who seeks it, including the depressed, the elderly bereaved, the troubled teen, right? So that's why, that's the new Dr. Kevorkian in my mind. Mm -hmm. I am not being hypocritical when I tell you to go get help just a little while ago. So this is nothing that I'm a proponent of or anything. I just want you to know that that's the type of shit that's out there. We're now 3D printing our own suicide capsules that double... As their fucking well, as their as their coffins. And yeah. also, it kind of makes. Wasn't this the Netherlands or something? Yeah, Switzerland. Yeah, I do think they have. I don't. I could be wrong, but I feel like the Nordic countries have a less of an attachment to 
like the Christianity of yep. it all mm -hmm. and why it would be morally corrupt to do something like that. So some people do have different views over it. like, yeah, you want to kill yourself? Fucking kill yourself. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's one of to those put things. It yeah, no, I, and I, and way. I know that's you. Yeah. You are saying that, um, hypothetically, but I, yeah. I, it's just one of those things where I think maybe we need to spend more time talking people off the ledge and giving them a ledge to jump off. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. where, and that's where we're doing for them to do it. Yeah. 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 Wait till so. TikTok gets a hold of that. People are going to be filming themselves for money, right. you know, near death experience. If they, you know, right. can you stop it or just doing it? So for, you know, I'll pay you such and such to do it and your family will get that money. And the, like, it's, it's mm. right. I, I was just, I was just floored by, you know, it's so fucking. It's so 2022 to say that you could build a suicide chamber by a 3D a, printer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you seen the movie Soylent Green? No. Oh, it's people. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I haven't seen it. Oh, the old school one. Yeah. Well, they kind of go into like a, a machine room and they die right. in a pod and they get turned into the the Soylent Green. Yeah. I don't like when you do one that off script. That I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I apologize, but I will tell you one thing. Like, even though we, you know, we obviously promote um, uh, therapy and whatnot here. If that's not your way, and if you or someone you know is in distress or contemplating suicide, there's also a suicide prevention lifeline. It's 800-273-8255 to speak to experts who uh, know and who listen. So it's 800-273-8255. We don't take that shit lightly, but that shit does exist, and that's what we do in Twisted History. What's up, Johnny? Uh, before we go, we have some announcements. We do have some announcements. Are you ready to go, or did you have anything else on your script? Uh, I have absolutely nothing left. I thought <laughs> I'd close on a high note with a machine that kills people. But what, <laughs> what, what's yeah. our announcements? Uh, well, no. Well, so I've been working on a trip with Wonton Don. Yep. So we may be going to India. He just did his series in the Balkans, and yep. he's never been to India, so we're working on it. Um, that was I, real. <laughs> yes, it is real. Yes, and I think I uh, thought you were putting a clip like a no. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the show. Yeah, so we might be doing two weeks in India. We'll do another series like similar to his Balkans and like right. food Love that. and explore. But anyway, I think what I understand, him. I'm coming over right for a weekend. Hey, is you that are a, more than like, uh, no, I'm not. Yeah, you are more than welcome. Both <laughs> yeah. of you are invited. But anyway, I think I'm going to have him on for like a segment. We'll do a little twisted his history of India, and I'll put it out on the handles and stuff. So yeah. So what what we'd cool. hope is that John goes. And does all the stuff with Wonton Don. We can do either multiple small segments with him and also have him do uh, perhaps the Twisted History of India. Like just simply the Twisted History of India or even one of like the nuances that they discover while they're on their trip. Because I like having the Wonton Don on and obviously John's going to have a shitload of stuff to talk about yeah. hanging around with this crazy bastard. If for some reason you don't know who he is, he's like our... Anthony Bourdain. He, yes. he just does food yeah. and culture videos. It's a perfect so. way to put it. Yeah. yeah. He was in Zimbabwe with Za. It was electric. Uh, so it's it's just fantastic. Completely off topic. I oh. also had another one. I want to get, and actually you could use two cents for this. Uh, did you see there's a new Jim Baker movie? T Tammy Faye Baker. Did you watch it? Yes. Oh, did you? So, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, what'd you think? Did you? I haven't seen it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Okay. Wasn't that good? Oh, see, I thought yeah. I don't think it got nominated for like a big Oscar, it's with but Jessica I think Jessica Chastain, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. I it, think it's on a smaller list. I can't remember. Uh, I enjoyed Jessica Chastain because she was exactly like Tammy Faye, uh, and then uh, what's his face? Andrew Garfield. Andrew Garfield was okay. Okay. Right. I think he should have been you. He was a little. Oh, he was a little too goofy. You know, yeah. I a girl I was dating one time. Her brother said I look like Andrew Garfield, and I have nice. never stopped. Technically, about that's that. a compliment. That was eight years ago. Right. Yeah. No, it was a compliment. She was she on the pill? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, we just started two documentaries. We're doing them simultaneously: the Cosby one I, and the Playboy one. I watched the Cosby one. It was good. Wait, yeah. what's the Cosby one on HBO? Or something? we need to talk about Bill Cosby. Showtime. The name of it, I think. So oh, Showtime. Showtime. Uh, I don't have. And that. then uh, the gentleman, I think a black comedian. <clears throat> who started it, you know, started uh, at a time when Cosby was tossed in prison and whatnot. And before he even got through with it, Cosby was released. So mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to the end of it. And I think I've told you guys before this thing about Playboy. I, it, they're right up to the point where he's about to fuck a dog, perhaps. But up to this point, I'm still team half. Wow. I got These it. Women, I got these women it. knew what they were signing up for. Yeah, they knew it. Uh, it's, it's you know, he was naturally. he's creepy and he's manipulative but I don't think that it was any different than any strip club owner. Mm -hmm. right. You know, like these girls now, I think there's a difference between um, regret and illegality. And I think they regret, regret living in a mansion, yeah. hanging out with... Uh, and, it, and I don't think they ever cried rape necessarily, but living in a mansion, hanging out with celebrities and doing coke every night. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because at the time... And by the way, the whole dichotomy between them being 20 and him being 50 doesn't make me want to be more team half. 
But for right now, he hasn't been the monster. But like I said, we're almost to the part well, where he may or may that. not fuck they're a dog. They're saying that they were forced to stay. They couldn't leave. Yeah. And it's like, you okay. know, they met, that's how they make it sound. Yeah. Meanwhile, at no point when they're, when they're retelling the story, right. but if he didn't use me, he would have just had somebody else. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not being forced to stay Correct. against your will. There's a difference between, you know. Did you watch uh, Tindler Swindler? This is a similar argument because it's, like, uh, it's like the woman who got um, – conned by this like con artist guy no oh yeah it's a big topic yeah. I'm sure I, haven't, been, I haven't seen it yet i feel like they've been talking about it over on the content side mm-hmm. of things yep they? yep yep i need to watch it it's a big this netflix weekend. documentary uh, the the bill cosby documentary made me watch the dick gregory documentary okay. and i feel like dick gregory and uh prior kind of got railroaded because they talked about real shit back in the day yeah yeah and meanwhile bill cosby kind of took the fast track because he was the family friendly right right PG, yeah, uh, black guy back then, yeah. and he, yeah. And last it's thing, interesting. Go to the barstool store. We now have twisted history speculums, <laughs> so they're they're engraved with the th, the iconic th. The people and in then the you store can do puppet, hate you. Not yeah, as cold as you think. Not, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's good as a gift. Valentine's Day just passed, but I mean Mother's Day right around the corner. We'll get sharpies. We'll sign them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, all right, I'm, I'm sign my speculum. Right, no more now. Is that gonna get right? See you next week. Speculum? Yes. (laughs) Speculum. Speculum. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you.